I just can't let you go Lord knows that I've tried to You said I was the only one No one likes being lied to You made this mess and left me with the pieces Now I wanna burn all the bridges between us I used to be the lost boy running insane I used to be the ghost boy looking for fame I used to work so hard to get it So hard to get it I used to be the one living in the fast lane I used to be the one who only cry in the rain I used to work so hard to get it And so hard to get it
boy running insane. Used to be the ghost boy looking for fame. I used to work so hard to get it. I used to be the one living in the fast lane. Used to be the one who only crying the rain. I used to work so hard to get it. It's so hard to get it. Welcome to this evening's lecture entitled Working Structures, Change, Frame, and the Infrathrin by Guy Guy Nordenson. This, uh, this is part of the Berlaga Keynotes, our ongoing lecture series featuring internationally prominent architects, designers, and thinkers at the forefront of design discourse and innovation. Guy Nordenson is a structural engineer and professor of architecture and structural engineering at Princeton University. He was the engineer of the Santa Fe Opera House, the Toledo Glass Museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and the International African Museum and Emanuel Nine Memorial in Charleston. His recent projects, all in Houston, include the Fine Arts Museum expansion, the Glassell School of Art, the, Moody, the Rice Moody Center, the Manil Drawing Institute, and the Rothko Chapel Restoration. He has had a decades-long relationship with the Museum of Modern Art in New York, where he co-curated the exhibitions Tall Buildings and Rising Currents, which his research project on the Palisade Bay served as the inspiration, and has edited numerous MoMA-related publications, including Seven Structural Engineers, the Felix Candela Lectures, and Structured Lineages, Learning from Japanese Structural Design. Um, well, it's a pleasure to have you kick off our spring season. Uh, Guy, welcome back to the Bear Laga. Thank you. Um, thank you. You can hear me okay? So uh, this is um, a talk about um, different aspects of practice can you turn this down? There's like an echo. No? Yeah. How about like that? That might be able to. Can you hear me still? Not so much. Okay. How's that? 
not so good. Okay, like that. This is good? Yeah? Okay. Um, so I want to run through a series of projects and activities that are all um, sort of different aspects of the practice of an engineer in New York, really just to give you maybe a broad picture of how um, one can act in society as a civil engineer, as a structural engineer in different, um, in different capacities. Um, so I'm going to start with some background. Um, it's nice to be here at, at, at TU. I was a student at MIT, um, starting out as a um, student of literature and philosophy. So I gradually moved toward engineering, but didn't start out that way. And one of the things that I was um, uh, very um, interested in and enthusiastic about at the time was the work in particular of Ezra Pound, the American um, poet, and this idea that he had that there were moments in history which he characterized as vortices or vortex, which were moments that were a kind of concentration of energy around a particular situation or project. And he used as examples of those situations a number of architectural works, including the Tempio Malatesta in, in Rimini. But it struck me at the time that these kinds of, of nodes of energy were really the places where one wanted to find um, opportunities. Another influence was um, one of a number of scientists that worked at MIT at the time, uh, including um, Cyril Stanley Smith, who had come from science to the history of science and in the history of science a focus on the relationship between art and science. Um, Smith wrote a wonderful book which I recommend called A Search for Structures. He was also involved in a series of exhibitions that he organized with Judith Wexler, who was an associate of Charles Eames. And these were studies in artifacts and processes which go very far back, like the making of Japanese swords or Damascus blades in the Middle East, where there were highly refined objects in, in the middle here, the, the ivory objects or ceramic glazes, or even old Chinese bronzes, which represented a certain development of technology that came from an aesthetic drive. So his theme and his thesis was that over and over again, scientific impor scientifically important properties of matter and technologically important ways of making and using them have been discovered or developed in an environment that suggests the dominance of aesthetic motivation. So his, his view was that there is a a trajectory, a vector that goes from a person's desire to make something beautiful to the development of certain techniques and technologies, usually that, that, that occur by chance. A glaze for a ceramic that comes from a particular mixture of minerals and other substances that has a chemistry that produces an effect that is wonderful, that becomes the basis of someone's practice, and so on. And the issue then is that over time, for example, if you study Japanese swords, you realize that the complexity of the metallurgy, for example, of those blades is the product of that kind of evolution, but it's an evolution that is entirely driven by um, the desire to keep improving and keep um, making the blade, in that case, more effective, but also more beautiful. And you see that in the grain of the steel, and you see it also in the properties. All of that precedes the discoveries of those processes through scientific methods. So there really is a, a kind of causal path from art to technology to science and not the other way around. And I think that's an important lesson, at least for me, that I learned in that environment. There's a wonderful series of books that was produced by Georgi Tepes and George Brazilier, the publisher, on these convergences that um, was coming out of the same um, culture. Different ways of practice, but practices that overlapped with one another in the sciences and, and the arts. Um, in that environment, I started a magazine, which we printed ourselves on a big press adjacent to the architecture uh, machine group that was starting up there 
with Nicholas Negroponte. This is a magazine that still exists now almost 30 years, no, almost 40 years later, sorry, almost 45 years later, um, which was an effort to bring together these different practices and activities within MIT as a way of showing these convergences between science, technology, and the arts. And so juxtaposing figure drawings with um, electron microscope um, images of metals and seeing formal relationships between these. Another influence was um, a number of different um, uh, folks within a generation that included Merce Cunningham and John Cage, who saw the way in which different practices could occur simultaneously and independently, but resonate with one another. And so this quote by Merce Cunningham from 20 years ago is a quote of how he and his partner, John Cage, would work together, how John Cage's music and, and Cunningham's um, choreography occurred alongside each other and had these moments of convergence, these moments of resonance, but it wasn't combined from the start. It was these kinds of parallel juxtapositions of practices. And I think you see that also in the evolution of jazz in a, in a practice, for example, of Miles Davis, which also goes through different periods where there is a period of collaboration with a number of other musicians that produces a certain body of music that then leads to another period where he goes electric with Bitches Brew, where he's working with a completely different um, group of musicians, including Wayne Shorter, who, who just recently passed away. So it's this idea that there are these temporal trajectories between art, science, and technology, and also these parallel practices that can take place and resonate with one another, but not necessarily all be completely convergent um, with each other. So keeping that in mind, and we'll come back to that, another aspect, I think, of the practice of engineering is the role that engineers can play in society, in particular in circumstances where um, there is a need to intervene sometimes in a rather um, immediate sense in a situation that requires engineering discipline, but that also requires a general um, uh, response of, 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 of someone who is a citizen in a in a, in a particular place under a particular set of circumstances. And, and one of those was um, what happened in New York um, in, in 2001. This is an aerial photograph of the site of Ground Zero after 9-11, um, which I obtained from, um, uh, from the government as a way to facilitate a process that I helped organize um, after 9-11. So we had an organization that I helped start in New York called the New York uh, Structural Engineering Association of New York, which was modeled after a similar association in California that had worked together as a community of engineers and scientists to focus on the earthquake problem in California over the course of 50 years, starting before World War II. We started a similar organization in New York, and that was in place before 9-11, and so we were able to mobilize um, several hundred engineers who could help on site provide advice as the construction companies that converged on the site under the city's um, oversight started to try to take apart both the, the remnants of the World Trade Center towers but also the impact of the towers on the adjacent buildings. I, um, and these are two buildings that were right next to the World Trade Centers that were impacted by, um, by the towers. We organized a, um, a group of 15 different engineers um, that came out, 15 different groups of engineers that came out right after, uh, the week after 9-11, to go about and do inspections of all the different neighborhoods around Ground Zero to determine which buildings were safe to reoccupy and which buildings still needed work before anybody could move back in. This was a voluntary effort that emerged in the days after 9-11 because the city didn't quite know how to handle this problem. And so we self-organized as a collection of engineers and other um, folks to make this um, come about. We then did these inspections. We then coded 
the, um, and I won't go into great detail here, but we coded the buildings that we found, which had been all evacuated. So the city had decided to ask everybody within this zone to leave their homes because they were concerned that those buildings were not safe. So our job, which we kind of appointed ourselves to do, was to go in there and do a systematic inspection from the street, but also using that photograph that I showed you from the top to see what happened on the roofs of these buildings and determine whether it was okay for people to go home. Some of the buildings that are shown there in red and yellow were not okay and those needed further study. And we published a book um, which is available that showed how that process um, came together. But it, it was a situation where the city was really um, paralyzed in its ability to deal with all the different aspects of that disaster, and so it was necessary for a group of engineers that happened to have already been organized um, to come together and step up and, and, and help out. After that, um, there was for a while a spirit that maybe out of that kind of constructive energy something positive could happen with the rebuilding of the site. It didn't quite end up that way, but for a while there were a number of efforts, including this one led by the architecture critic of the New York Times at the time, Herbert Mouchamp, which came up with a number of different alternatives um, for what might happen at the site, and, and what that was published um, in the New York Times a year after 9-11. Subsequent to that, in order to try to reflect on the role of tall buildings in, um, in New York in particular, I helped organize with Terry Riley an exhibition on tall buildings at the Museum of Modern Art. And that was a, a, a way of showing, from my perspective, the importance and variety of tall buildings, including some of the buildings that were designed, like you see the one in the middle there that Ben Van Berkel had a role in, um, which were uh, ways of responding to the, the, effect, the, the consequences of 9-11 and, and in that context maybe rethink what tall buildings might be like. I was also interested in looking at the relationship between architects and engineers working on tall buildings to understand how they collaborate and how those collaborations are productive. In particular, if you start to think about sections through tall buildings, I think one of the ways in which you can define the quality of a tall building is the quality of the section of that tall building. Then, so if you look at this catalog and that exhibition, there was a focus there on those buildings, tall buildings that had significant interesting um, sectional conditions. We also went back and studied the World Trade Center building itself and looked at the ways in which the creativity of the engineer was embedded in that building without anyone actually understanding it until we started to study and represent that creative intelligence. This is a drawing that we did at Princeton um, with a number of students which drew the variety of different steels that the engineer of this building, Les Robertson, had introduced into the building. And he did that in the exterior of the building, which is a kind of, of, of shell around the building. It's a tube frame, so the primary structure resisting the wind is on the perimeter and is based on the, was based on these closely spaced columns that create a grid that is almost like a solid surface. Within that grid, which you see here, each of the vertical elements, each of the columns, was a square made always the same size, connected with these plates that acted as beams, which are also always the same size. So from the bottom of the building to the top of the building, the sectional geometry doesn't change, but the materials change. And so the, the, the thing you see there in the middle is a representation of the different types of steels that Robertson used from regular mild steel that is sort of normative to very high strength steel which is shown in red. The reason that he was ver varying the steel was to manipulate the dimensions of those plates that make up those columns and beams in order to take load from some places and move it to other places. There's a tendency with these kinds of tubes for the loads to get concentrated in the corner. 
What he was doing by using the higher strength steel was making the elements thinner, the plates thinner, in order for them to shed load and move it to other places. So it's slightly counterintuitive. He's not making it stronger because it needs to be stronger. He's making it stronger in order to make it smaller, in order for it to be less stiff, in order for the load to go someplace else. This was something that he did and that was represented in tables and numbers and so on that had never been visualized before we did this drawing, but I think represents a kind of creative energy and intensity that Robertson brought really to all his projects, um, not just in the way that he designed, but in the way that that design represents the relationship of two towers in the city, buffeted by the wind, coming from different directions, sometimes off the water, sometimes through the city. So what you're seeing in this color diagram is this merging of the environmental conditions under which the building is designed, which means the wind load is different from different directions, but also the creative manner in which the engineer interpreted those conditions. Um, I worked afterwards with David Childs on a first iteration of the tower um, to replace the World Trade Center, which was to be uh, half solid, half open, um, that was eventually modified into the first version of the World Trade Center Tower that was published, I think it was 2005 or thereabouts, and then that was set aside and replaced by the one that was built um, since. That's another um, story. In the process of all this work at Ground Zero, at um, working on the exhibition, working on this tower with David Childs, it became clear to me that that there was this opportunity not necessarily to focus right at that location in Lower Manhattan, all these functions and all these um, uh, all this energy, but maybe to open it up to a larger metropolitan area and use some of the rebuilding that was necessary to recenter um, New York away from Manhattan to reflect the fact that the city was expanding to become much more decentered, much more um, multipolar. And we had the opportunity to work on a project for the Port Authority to design a tower that would replace, the, the, that would provide a place for the television antennas that had been on top of the World Trade Center, but in a different location in the middle of the, of the harbor. Here the idea was to have an open structure, an open frame, that would maybe have a different representational quality that was based on the notion that you could orient a series of seven tubes in relationship to each other so that given the orientation and strength of the wind, which is different, the maximum wind that you have to design for is different from different directions, oriented in such a way that they would shield each other and reduce the total impact of the wind much like a bicycle uh, team uses their positions to shield each other and, and um, reduce the drag on each individual. So the orientation of these tubes as they rise up to make this tower was based on that, on that idea. That in turn led to another project, which was a study of this body of water, which we recognized as a kind of public space in New York metropolitan area, analogous in some ways to the role that Central Park played um, in the 19th century, a place that was starting to become this, this sort of center around which New Jersey, Staten Island, Brooklyn could be looking out on each other, much like different parts of Venice look out on each other over St. Mark's Basin. We thought this might be also an opportunity to rethink how that part of New York on the water would be, could be transformed both to provide um, leisure activities, maybe ecological services, um, but also uh, anticipate the need to adapt to sea level rise and climate adaptation. So this project, which was funded by the American Institute of Architects, was to reimagine this body of water as a new kind of public space adapted to the changes imposed by um, the changing climate. We published a book that, um, that reflects that work and imagined what different parts of the city could be within that framework, including ways in which 
you could go out on the water, which at the time was a bit of a taboo given environmental concerns, and, and create new kinds of structures in the water, natural structures in the water that would help protect, um, in this case, lower Manhattan. That research became the basis of an exhibition that was organized by Barry Bergdahl um, at the Museum of Modern Art, which was all about this notion that designers could step in and provide alternative approaches to developing resilience along the coast in different, um, in different parts of this bay. So we had a competitive process that we organized which selected five different teams that were then assigned different parts of this part of, of New York, that body of water which we called Palisades Bay, and were asked to design interventions in all those places. The show actually triggered the practices of a number of the participants who have since become quite proficient and quite active in this area of coastal resilience. So it helped initiate a certain way of thinking of the combination of nature and engineering structures that could contribute to improving the resilience of coastal communities. That was two years before we were hit by Hurricane Sandy. So all of those ideas then were refocused in New York um, around some of the rebuilding that took place after Hurricane Sandy. In a way, a kind of replay of what happened after 9-11, um, where the city had to rethink how to approach um, its rebuilding and do so hopefully in a way that was responsible and, and equitable. So a number of different commissions were set up and those started to internalize, this was one set up by the governor of the state of New York, started to internalize these notions that had been developed in that research and then um, exhibited in different forms in that um, exhibition at MoMA, um, including an important notion which is represented in this cover on, on, on your uh, left, which is a planning study that was done by the New York City Planning Department on how to think about the region and the waterfront, which reflected the idea that we had, uh, we had um, proposed that we should think of the continuity of the landscape both underwater and above water, that, that the section through the water, the section that includes the bathymetry underwater and the topography above water, that's a continuous surface. And that continuous surface is then, um, is then occupied by a dynamic fluid, you know, which is uh, the ocean. So the notion that the water um, and the, the underwater topography is a dynamic system was something that became much more, um, much more in the consciousness of the city and in its planning. So there's a whole series of books that came out of this, <coughs> this work, sorry, um, which reflects um, these approaches. And then on the MoMA side, a number of different studies that um, Talman mentioned, both the tall building um, uh, book and catalog, which reflects that exhibition, but also initiatives to bring engineers to together to represent their work in the Museum of Modern Art so that a larger community would understand the complexity of their practices and the value and interest and intellectual um, interest of, of what they're up to. The middle one is a um, series of lectures that I organized in the 90s that brought together a generation of engineers, sort of the generation born in the 30s, York Schleich, Heinz Eisler, um, Cecil Bauman, who was a little, a little bit younger, who came each to talk about their practices in front of a large, um, broad audience. The other one on, on your right was a, a, a conference workshop that we organized where a number of engineers, including Laurent Ney from Belgium and Mike Schleich from Germany, all came and reflected on the practice of structural engineering in Japan and its relationship to, to architecture. So the cultural interactions that happens between structural engineering and the rest of society is, I guess, the theme of what I'm representing in the first part of, of, of this talk. So I'd like to go through quickly a number of projects which I've organized around themes. Um, the first one of the frame, of the very simple idea of a structure that um, is 
um, either vertical or horizontal, basically. And in this case, a series of projects that come that come together around a kind of notion of stacking, of how you build something by piling one thing on top of another. This is a church I um, worked on with Richard Meyer in Rome, which was a competition uh, which Meyer won with this form, which is a bit unusual for his practice, um, but looks like a series of it's almost like a Richard Serra sculpture with a series of these um, curved planes that are nested into each other, all facing toward the south. So the south sun hits broadside on these um, three walls. <coughs> um, there, the, the sort of, um, <clears throat> I think the operating assumption that Meyer would have had in approaching the development of this design once we won the competition would be to build a steel structure and apply a form of metal panels, glazed metal panels like he's done in many of his projects like the one in The Hague to create that white surface. I argued that it would be more compelling if we were to make this out of solid blocks of prefabricated concrete, much like a big Roman structure or even like some of the structures of Pierluigi Nervi. Luckily, um, one of Nervi's disciples was working with us on the project and a large Italian cement company was offering to support the project. And so there was a lot of enthusiasm about the idea that these would be made not in metal but in concrete. And so here what you see are these three shells that are um, made of stacked pieces of concrete prefabricated that you see here on, on the right up there, upper right corner, prefabricated in Bergamo in northern Italy and then brought and lifted into place with this giant gantry, La Machina we called it, that was actually numerically controlled to lift the pieces up and then position them and put them one at a time um, on top of the um, on top of the shell. There, your bottom right, you can see some of the pieces and also the tracks on which this gantry moved. Um, it was slow, it was deliberate, it was a very kind of theatrical project that I think entertained the children in the neighborhood um, over the several years that it took to, to build this. Um, similar to that, um, around the same time was a dormitory um, with Stephen Hall at MIT which was also built out of stacked units, in these case, these great gridded units, um, inspired, if you will, a little bit like the units of which the World Trade Center was made, not that many years before that. And these were prefabricated in Canada and brought together and spliced at the floor level by concrete reaching out and becoming a kind of mortar between the, 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 these um, kind of Lego pieces, if you will, of, of the concrete, and also spliced at the upper left horizontally by casting concrete around some rebar that, that stuck out. Again, a very theatrical kind of process where the installation of those pieces clearly was not a normal form of construction and so caught the attention of the students at MIT, in this case, who watched this go up. The other in interesting intervention was given that this grid was operating as a structure in order to reach out and provide the cantilevers around the corners, et cetera. It had a whole variety of different states of stress in it. And we wanted to keep, again, maybe influenced by the World Trade Center, we wanted to keep all the members the same size. They're all 10 inches, 25 centimeters square. And we wanted to keep them the same size. We wanted to limit the amount of reinforcement in them. And in order to make that work, there were times where we had to fill in the squares with concrete, as you can see here, this kind of freckle pattern, which reflected the ways in which um, the, the overstresses were then occurring and handled around big openings or other features. So there's a, there's a representation throughout this of the process of design, but also the mechanisms of the structure itself, including the reinforcement 
in those lines of that grid, represented here by a diagram that the engineer on site kept um, in order for her to be able to do the inspections of the rebar, coding the red for the, the larger bars and the blue for the smaller bars and so on. That became the inspiration for the color pattern on the, on the facade, which Stephen um, Paul wanted from the very beginning. So it became then a reflection of both the stresses and the resulting reinforcement in the structure um, throughout. So different ways in which that process and the theater of the construction um, end up in the representation of the final um, building. Um, this was also with Stephen. This is the Nelson Atkins Museum, a beautiful uh, project, well worth a visit to Kansas City, alongside a garden by Dan Kiley that, um, that is in front of this museum in, in, in the back, over the top of a garage um, that's underground here is a Walter de Maria piece that has these wonderful portholes that come down through the structure and illuminate the top level of the garage. We designed what we called wave tees in the garage, which were prefabricated um, concrete um, long span beams that had that kind of wave profile, each of which was supported on a column so that you wouldn't have any structure in the other direction. And the reason for that was so that you could feel the corrugation of the space all the way through and, and especially enjoy the fact that because of the sloping for drainage of the surface above, you have this great kind of variation in compressed and very tall spaces um, inside this, this garage. It's a, it's, a, it's a very successful garage. And you can see here um, during construction right in front of the, the older building of that of that Nelson Atkins Museum. Um, finally, in this collection here is the Glassell School with Stephen Hall as well. Um, this continues this idea of working with precast concrete and using large pieces of, of concrete stacked on each other as a way to create a kind of um, tectonic force in the expression of, of the building. This is a school next to the Museum of Fine Arts that is made with these large vertical panels of prefabricated concrete that are installed, stand up, kind of like big stone um, meniers, and then joined together at the floor line with a cast-in-place concrete band. Uh, so there's a beam that you can see there right above that goes all the way around, that stitches all the pieces together as well as tied to the, the, the pieces above. There you can see that beam. So the vertical piece is precast concrete. They're horizontal precast concrete, prefabricated sort of standard hollow core planks that make up the floor, and they meet at these cast-in-place kind of mortar-like joints um, at the... Um, at these, uh, and on the left there you can see the the standard, those are standard industrial products, the hollow core slab that make up the, um, that make up the, the floor. But as this thing gets stacked up, because of that mortar line at the floor, you can then join two levels of these um, blocks to create a deep beam that allows you then to cantilever around the corner. So it's a little bit a little bit like the MIT project where you're using the facade that has become structure as well as facade as a way to reach around a corner and lift um, a part of the building above a hollow um, underneath. There's a nice the building is like a uh, L shape and there's a really nice space with a bunch of beams running in different kind of Pyrenaean effect that we achieved with the structure and the stairs in this common space. Um, kind of a version of this space right here. So moving from stacking to span, um, this is really just about um, how to play with the necessity of bridging or, or spanning across long distances and see what the possibilities are in, in exploring that. Um, Another project of Stephen Hall's, this was in, in, um, in Beijing um, in 2009, really 
very effective complex of buildings, creating a public space, there's a Cinematheque that Stephen um, insisted was to be built in the court that is enclosed by these towers. It's, it's accessible, it's not gated. It really made a statement about what could possibly, what, what were the possibilities of public space in Beijing at the time and linked therefore why it's called linked hybrid, linked at the top by a continuous run of bridges that tie all these buildings together and that create also a public accessible space with some commercial activities up in the air connected by these um, bridges that you see here. That's one of the bridges being lifted up after it's fabricated um, on, the, on the floor, on the roof below. Also, there has a number of these cantilevers that reach out from the primary structure and create these larger portions of the, of, the, of the structure. The structure itself is concrete, cast in place in a grid, so not precast, and it's a very stiff structure. We had in the core, um, all concrete walls in the core, and in addition to that, this grid structure on the perimeter, and that proved to be um, beneficial because we discovered, working with Xiao Konzen, the um, Chinese engineer that we collaborated with, um, we discovered that it was that the buildings were stiff enough that we could free the bridges from the movements of the building in an earthquake. Beijing is subject to earthquakes. Um, it's not very severe, but it's still significant. And so we had to design these buildings to withstand earthquakes, but also these bridges to behave in the earthquake um, properly. And the solution was to isolate them. You see there on the right and the left, to isolate them on bearings that would actually allow the bridges to float relative to the towers. In other words, the towers could move in the earthquake, but the bridges were completely isolated and they could stay still um, because of the bearings that we had supported. So they're completely free of the movement of the buildings. We could get away with that because the distance that these towers are moving because they're so stiff is quite small. And as a result, the bearings would have enough travel in them to accommodate that, that movement. A little counterintuitive and a little scary when we were first talking about it, but it worked out well. And in one of them, I think the one there on the right, um, there's a swimming pool. So you could be swimming in the pool during an earthquake and feel nothing because the buildings would be wiggling around and your swim, swimming pool would not be aware of that. The Kimball um, is in addition to Louis Kahn and Auguste Commandant's um, Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth um, with Renzo Piano. Um, on the left there, you see the, the Kahn building. On the right, the now called Piano Pavilion, which is very much a mirror in organization of the Kahn building. Three long spans with gaps in between. Pretty much the same thing um, translated across. On the right side, under the snow there, is the amphitheater and other facilities that are suppressed down below ground. So the scale of the pavilion is in length, in, in organization, very similar to the scale of Khan's building. But the materials are different. And the decision here, which I think was important, was to make the roof out of wood as opposed to trying to make it out of some metal system or to try to respond to the concrete shells that make the roof of Khan's building. The walls, however, are concrete, and they were made, they're very beautiful, and they were made with help from um, a, a, a specialist from Venice, Dottor, who came and worked with the team in Texas who made the concrete um, for these walls. And so you have this nice juxtaposition between the wooden beams, their um, Douglas fir beams, and the, and the cast in place concrete. The concrete walls are hollow, allowing for the air to go up through the walls. So they serve both as structure, but also as the walls on which you hang the paintings, but as well as a conduit for the air. 
in order to cast them without any ties, because Piano wanted there not to be any of those tie holes that you see in the adjacent building, for example, by Tadaando, the forms had to be cantilevered off the grounds and very stiff in order to maintain the tolerances. So lots of things that these walls had to achieve um, and, um, and work out as well as they did. The roof is made up of uh, four foot deep beams paired, made out of Douglas fir, eight inches wide, that span 100 feet or 30 meters roughly and support a glass roof. So there's nothing in the roof that helps to stabilize the structure horizontally, and those light diagonal lines that you see are the structure that provides that horizontal um, bracing, which includes taking care of the wind loads from the glass walls on either side. They're paired beams with a structure in between that you can start to see here that ties them to each other that also helps them from rolling over. So because these beams are pretty skinny and because they're only braced in the middle, they could potentially roll over and buckle. And so a lot of the detailing that you see and is visible is the way in which you use the pairing of the two beams to give them the kind of resistance that's necessary for them not to twist. Um, and these are some of the details that went into that. And because wood moves, all that detailing has to accommodate the expansion and contraction of the wood. So it's, it's, it gets pretty tricky. These were made in, in um, British Columbia by a company called Structure Lamb. Um, small detail, the thickness of the laminations are two inches, which is a little thicker than the norm. We had to do a series of tests to make that okay. But that gave these beams a distinct quality um, that sort of took them away from what might seem like a more commercial um, product. And there you have the final result. Those little lines that you see are the ways in which the interior metal bracing is tied through the beam to the, um, to the outside. Um, around the same time with Tom Pfeiffer, um, another structure that has also some unusual roof beams. Um, this is at the Corning Museum of Art, um, the Corning Museum of Glass in Corning, New York. It's a company, Corning, that makes the Gorilla Glass on your iPhones and has been in business making glass for many, many years. They have a great collection of art glass objects that they exhibit in a variety of museum buildings. I did another building that's right behind there with um, Laurie Hawkinson and Henry Smith Miller about 15 years before this building. This is an exhibit space for contemporary glass. And so the lighting doesn't have to be subdued as it might for other works of art. It can be pretty bright in these spaces. So we came up with a roof system which supports the roof structure and the, the skylights um, which is made of these long, very skinny um, concrete uh, beams in the spirit, really, of Sverfen's pavilion um, in Venice, if you recall, that has thin beams um, that are tall and, and quite skinny. These are prefabricated in Canada, similar to the MIT building, and they're supported on these curvilinear walls that form the different galleries within this space, which are also cast in place, um, well, also concrete, but in that case, cast in place. So the beams are precast. Those walls also have a cavity in them, similar to the Kimball, which allows the air to come up and down um, as well. But they're not exposed. In this case, those concrete walls have been plastered um, in the finished condition. Here you see a series of images that shows the construction of those walls, and they actually serve both as the wall supporting the roof above, but as also the beam supporting the floor below. So there's, a, there's an administrative space at the ground level, and that only has columns in it, and the slabs in that space are supported by the walls that produce the gallery spaces above. So they're, they're, they're beams, um, wall beams that serve multiple functions. Um, that again is something similar to um, what August Commandant did in Kahn's museum in, uh, at the Kimball. 
And then the roof goes on, as you see here, and is attached by little uh, what we call shoes that sit on top of the wall. Um, and here's, a, here's one of them coming in, and you can see the shoes on the left side there. So the relationship between the wall and the beam changes a lot as, you are, as the walls are curving, so these, these um, details that support the fins um, all have to be varied in, in different ways as you go along. This is them being prefabricated in Canada, northern Canada, at the Béton Préfabriqué du Lac, BPDL, um, and they did an amazing job in the finish work. And because they're so thin, all they have is a reinforcing bar at the top, a couple down the middle, and one at the bottom. So they're, um, they're, they're working pretty hard. They span upwards of 20 meters in some cases, and they're only, um, what, eight, eight centimeters wide. The big issue th with these, again, like at the Kimball, is whether or not they would roll over and, um, and buckle. The African American Museum in Washington with David Ache and, and Phil Freelon um, was, the idea there was, um, of David's, was to have a free and open space at the ground level with the structure coming down only in the central elevator cores. And those became a kind of symbol or four pil pillars of the institution. So there was a relationship there between the architecture and engineering idea and the institutional identity as expressed on their, um, on their website. The, the cores were made out of a steel cage that was then filled in with concrete. So the steel could go up rapidly and support the rest of the structure, and then the concrete could follow behind. Um, the rest of the structure hangs off those cores. So it's a little bit like building a bridge with the struts coming off of that, or like a tree, if you like, with the struts coming off and supporting the floors. And then the, the skin of the building is hanging from the roof down um, off of that. So it's, it's a floating uh, screen, and there's a large porch um, on one side of the structure that, um, that provides some shelter. OK, the last part um, sort of goes back maybe to the beginning, which is the ways in which I think one can think about the role of structure or the role of engineering in architecture as having a conceptual um, function. And this idea that Duchamp has of the infra-thin, of, 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 of some sense of a presence that is immaterial and, and, and ephemeral. And I think it's possible to also see that in the work of many artists that were influenced by Duchamp, again, going back to Cunningham and, and, and John Cage, but, but many others as well. Projects where there is there's a conceptual um, um, back, background to the project, which is reflected in a very um, sometimes subtle and nuanced way that um, might evade perception, but I think is still um, present. This is a chapel that I worked on at the Menil with Francois de Menil, the son of Dominique de Menil, which was a recreation of a chapel in Cyprus that had housed frescoes that had been stolen <coughs> and recovered in Germany in pieces and then restored by de Menil and brought temporarily for about 15 years to live at the Menil in Houston. The idea was a structure made of glass that would be set inside a kind of spider web of steel, um, solid round members, three quarters of an inch. So what is that, about, um, I don't know, 15, 16 millimeters, that would be pulled tight between the roof and the floor. So kind of like a tension net, but made out of solid bars, not cables. And then setting the glass in that to form the shape of the original church and position the frescoes where they were in that um, original church. It lived there for 15 years, and then we took it apart 
15 years later when the frescoes moved back to um, Cyprus. So it was a temporary structure, quite ephemeral um, as well. Related to that maybe is the, a series of stairs that I've worked on over the years, which I call cascade stairs, but are often described as cantilever stairs. The image on the right is in Greece, a very old example, I think this was in, in Milos, of how these work where you take a stone, plant it on one side into a wall, and then overlap each stone tread on the one below so that they can lean on each other down to the ground. Palladio at the Academia in Venice, in the image on the left, um, did this. There's many examples in the Renaissance, in Urbino, in other places. There are examples that Neo-Palladian architects in um, England, Inigo Jones and others have used. And it's, it's, it's a tradition that goes way back that is based on the discovery that is, if you have a series of torsionally stiff members, it could be stone, that stick out of the wall and are interconnected to each other, because each one leans on the one below, each individual step is basically twisted by the load from above and the reaction, the load from, sorry, twisted by the load from above and the reaction from below. As long as that twist can work its way back into the wall, the load itself will find its way down the stairs. Part of it goes in the walls, part of it goes down the what I call the cascade, and the effect is of, of, of a stair that looks like it's cantilevering off of um, one side. In this case, we did that a little bit more um, daringly by making the wall out of, um, out of glass. So these are steel tubes that penetrate through the glass wall connected with aluminum plates that create the continuity as you go down. Um, twist goes into the glass wall, vertical reaction goes into the glass wall, but the remainder of the load goes down the stairs to the floor. And there are many examples like this. Um, this was during a fundraiser that I was able to get a picture of, um, of, that, of that stair. Um, it's, it's, it's the representation of an idea that has been percolating through architectural history going back really to um, the pre-classical pre period, I think. There's also great examples in Syria as well. At the Museum of Modern Art with Taniguchi, there's two features that I think represent this notion of thinness or infra-thinness. One is the glass wall that faces the garden, sorry, which is um, made of the steel bars that are um, also about eight centimeters wide that span 60 feet that are solid bars that are interconnected and make something that I think to the eye um, appears almost infinitesimal in, um, in dimension. I think next time you go to the museum, you can, you can see that. And then the other feature there was the disappearance of a column that um, happened during the, f the um, design process where, sorry, where there was um, a column in one of the, the galleries, which was later used to show the Sarahs, that um, we were able to remove because we could hang the other floors from the, the truss above. This was something that happened late in the design process and was kind of good luck that was um, an opportunity to get rid of that, um, that column. The funny bit about it is that because it happened so late in the process, it became a kind of urban legend and people who were given tours of the construction site were taken to this spot and uh, the person giving the tour tried to explain how miraculous it was that this column had disappeared. So basically all about something that wasn't there anymore. The Toledo um, Museum with uh, Sejima Nishizawa, with Sana, as you know, is, is, is the representation really of a diagram, the diagram of the spaces that are the gallery spaces, many of them surrounded in glass, all housed under this very thin roof supported on, on, on thin columns, which because they're distributed in a slightly random location because of the way in which 
the, the structure moves around and the fact that those columns are trying to land in between these double layers of glass that form the, um, um, that form the partitions, the structure basically disappears and you get the feeling that as you walk through this, it's the glass that's holding up um, the roof. In order to keep that roof very thin, there's a lot of effort in getting all the pieces to weave past each other or through each other, the drainage, the, the sprinkler, and so on, and it gets pretty complicated, all of which, including the difficulty of, of coordinating the position of the glass and the fittings of the glass um, that hold the glass in place around even the size of, of, of bolts in order to achieve this um, this result. All right, this is almost the end here. This is a more recent project <coughs> at the Menil again with Johnson Mark Lee. It's the drawing center. And the design included these two um, outside gardens, canopy around these outside gardens that you see here in, the, in this diagram, um, which we proposed, given the way in which the architecture was all about folding of the surfaces reflecting really the theme of this being a drawing center, we suggested that maybe we could make these canopies out of steel plate. So it was basically a series of folded steel plates that were half an inch thick, so 12, centimeter, 12 millimeters thick. And the, the welding of those plates, the slope of the plates, would give them the strength to span over the distances around these, these, um, these two courtyards, as you see here. What you see then, at times, is the materiality of that surface, of the, the, the stiffeners that you can see here in this diagram that keep that thin plate from buckling, those stiffeners get translated visually through the plate because of the welding in certain kinds of light. So you see this, you see this kind of wavy pattern in certain light, but not in other lights. So when the light is coming from behind you on the flat wall, which is also made of steel plate, it's very abstract. But then when you come around to the side or the light is raking from the side, it starts to feel much more material. And so I think that, that duality in the way in which these folded plates um, operate is a really useful part of the, of, of the, of the design. And they, they were prefabricated in very large pieces, brought together and then welded down the mitre corner um, where they met. And they're also clad in... Um, Port Orford Cedar, which is uh, the, basically j the Janapi, uh, the, 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 the Hinoki wood from which um, the Ise Shrine is made in, uh, in, in Japan. So that dark surface that you see on the left there is a stained um, Port Orford Cedar that has been actually glass bead blasted and has a really beautiful texture as well. The final project is a sculpture which was completed a couple years ago, which um, was an idea that David Hammonds, who you see here on the left image with the um, museum director of the Whitney, Adam Weinberg, Hammonds um, was visiting the Whitney Museum with Adam and they were walking around, they came out to this window in Piano's building looking out over the water and Adam pointed out that the day's end um, intervention that Gordon Matta Clark did in 1975 had been pretty much in front of where they were looking out in the, on this pier. This is Matta Clark's project. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he occupied this shed and that had actually been used by the community for sunbathing and other purposes after it was abandoned, Matta Clark took it over, locked it, went in there and cut these large openings at the end and also in the floor and turned it into this very large cathedral of light. Um, here you see after he was finished, the sunbathers back um, in some of these photographs. There's a lot of really great 
um, photographic records, both of Maddox Clark's intervention, but also of um, of the way in which these piers were occupied over over many years. They finally um, were demolished in 1979, and David Hammond's idea was to, to resurrect the idea of this um, pier through this skeleton or ghost of the pier, which he visualized in this sketch. We were given this sketch then by Adam Weinberg and asked to, to execute it, um, which we did um, with sort of intermittent interventions by, by David Hammonds, who is famously um, reclusive. So a lot had to do with the interpretation of that sketch and the interpretation of his, of his intent <coughs> in, in developing the, the structure out on the water. So the scale of the members, the, the nature of the connections, the ways in which members um, met each other, all of that um, were, were important decisions to keep as close as possible to the, the basic intent. And a lot of visualization along the way, this is the rendering that we did of what we thought it would look like with the scale of members and the geometry um, that we had arrived at. We built models. Um, my wife, Catherine Sievert, built this model, um, which is in, in the museum. We added uh, a member across to stiffen the structure against the wind, but we also removed some members that we didn't need. So it was very much about producing the abstraction of the drawing, which required two important things, or three important things. One was the finish, that it had this kind of ghostly quality. We used a very special kind of stainless steel called super duplex, which is very highly corrosion resistant. It's also made of two types of steel, ferrite and austenite, so it also has a kind of iridescence from the combination of those two grain structures. Um, the plate came from Belgium, was rolled in Verona, and then shipped to Canada where it was fabricated into large units that were then brought and mechanically connected on site. So this is in the plant in Toronto where the pieces were being made. This is, these are the columns, each of, each of which had these arms sticking out from them which were then connected to, um, to the beams with these very um, discrete joints. These are machine couplers that make and are then joined with the pins that you see th going through the two pins that secure them together. And that's the only connection that you have in the field. Um, partly in order to maintain the quality of the work through maximum prefabrication, but also because it was necessary um, to do everything mechanically because you're not allowed to weld or pour concrete over the water for environmental reasons. Um, so these is what those couplers look like. The gray, the dark gray is made of solid steel machined to, um, to these dimensions. Here you see it in the machine tool, and they are made to fit on each other and then are joined in such a way, including that little bump that you see there, the boss, so that they form a rigid connection. That means that the structure is entirely rigid. So it's a, it's a large rigid frame that resists the wind um, loads that act on it. The joint itself is a casting that was made in Brazil, in southern Brazil, also of this same material of super du duplex which um, is hard to cast because you have to put it in the mold, molten, and then you can't leave it in the mold because of the nature of this particular steel very long, so then you have to break the mold quickly and then manipulate the very hot casting, as you see here in this image that I took during that, during that process. So it starts with the, the, the sand mold, the casting, and then you have a rough piece that is eventually machined into that that you saw in that first image. Finally, the importance of straightness was a real challenge. It was clear that we wanted a structure in the end that looked like the drawing. And in order for that, a couple of things had to happen. All the horizontal members had to be dead flat. All the vertical members had to be 
straight. But because it's made of material and because they're very thin, they're, um, they're 20 centimeters um, in diameter and they span um, about 20 meters. So it's a 1 to 100 span to depth ratio, which is highly unusual. And so they would naturally sag on their own weight. To counter that, you have to fabricate them so they're bend, bent in the opposite direction. But you have to do that for the whole structure and coordinate it so the columns are tilted in a little bit, the, the end frames are designed because uh, so they're tilted out a bit so they come in. Everything has to be um, sort of bent in the opposite manner in which it wants to deflect. And that's not an exact science, so getting it to all come together was, um, was a challenge for the fabricators and everybody else, especially since you're walk working out on the water where there's a lot of um, opportunities for imprecision, including the fact that the piles on which this is supported are 170 feet deep, so that's, what, about 50, 60 meters um, deep. So it's, it's, it's kind of miraculous that it came together as straight as it did. The last thing is because these members are so thin, under certain wind conditions, they start to vibrate because of a phenomenon called vortex shedding. So because little vortices form on the backside of these, they, you can see them move. So there's a kind of effect in that movement of the sort of waviness of a pencil line. So in all ways, um, this has um, represented uh, the physical reality of that, of that drawing. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. Uh, the questions. Um, thank you for your lecture. I was wondering, um, you just presented quite a lot of non-ordinary technological <laughs> solutions. And I was wondering, how do you um, convince your clients um, to go in, to go actually do that? The, the, the challenge is to convince my client to give me normal projects. Um, the, the, you know, when you're, when you're in practice, you're very dependent on whether people want to come to you or go to somebody else. And people come with this kind of project, um, which, um, which is great. But they don't come around all the time. So I have a small practice that really is um, historically been kind of limited by the fact that we have um, we have these kinds of opportunities, but that's, that's all that comes. So sometimes we sit around waiting for the next one of these to show up, and they don't show up for a while. Um, so we're not really convincing people um, to do these projects, but we do on occasion, like with the Menil or some of the other projects, find an opportunity within the project to convince everybody that it would be, you know, useful, productive, interesting, um, uh, meaningful to make it this way as opposed to that way. I think with the Menil Drawing Center is a good example where the materiality of those surfaces and the fact that they shift between being abstract, thin, and more present. Um, same with this structure. I mean, if you get up close and you look at the casting, you see the slight waviness of the casting. Even though it's been machined, it looks different from the rest of it. So these nuances, I think, make a difference for some people um, and for projects. And if you can explain that and convince people, then you, then you can make these interventions within, within the project. And then usually people regret it afterwards because it's difficult. You know, it's like, why did you convince me to do this? <laughs> you know? And then you get through the trauma, and then they don't remember, and then everybody's happy. Um. Hello. Thank you for the keynote. Um, I always believe that the structure of a project 
its materiality and the way it would be eventually constructed, even how it responds to earthquakes are all design choices and, and issues that should be addressed at the very beginning of the design project. And since um, I haven't practiced our architecture yet, uh, my question to you is, at what time during the design project should the architect and the engineer start collaborating? That depends on the architect. I think that um, there's some who enjoy sitting down with a blank piece of paper and brainstorming. There are others who need time to think and draw. Uh, you know, I've worked with Stephen Hall for 40 years, and Stephen gets up every morning and he does watercolors. And he'll show up with a watercolor and you know, many times he has a very clear idea, not just of the architecture, but of how it's going to be made, what it's going to be made of, and so on. And so the discussion starts from there. He's um, always open-minded about changes, but he has to start with the watercolor. Um, I think as long as, as long as people, you know, find a way to open up the process at the right time for them, but then keep it open, mm -hmm. then it's possible to um, then it's, it's possible to make a contribution. Um, it's also, there are times, I didn't show any of these projects, but there, there, you know, the example of Miles Davis I use sometimes because in, in many other fields, it's possible for relationships to flip. Like if you think of film, sometimes a, an actor acts as a director. And so the configuration of that particular project means that they take on a different role than they might usually take on. And, and there have been occasions that I've been involved in where um, those roles have shifted with the same people. And I think that um, that's also productive because then you see each other in a different light. If, if you're leading the project, then um, and, and, and they w they're willing to accept that, then you can play a different kind of tune together. You have to find people, ultimately, who trust you and who you trust. Um, and that's not always easy. So when you find them, you want to hang on. Um, thank you. Hi. Thank you for a very inspiring lecture. And um, reflecting maybe specifically to the last project, and uh, to you s saying uh, uh, about like talking about multiple ways uh, and roles of engineer, I was thinking um, because the structure seemed to travel all around the world be before it came to the site, uh, casting in Brazil and uh, steel from Belgium, etc. And I was thinking, at what stage uh, comes the conversation? about where to produce actually the elements, source them, and um, yeah, it's a masterpiece in the end, but what, is that conversation right. increasingly important maybe from your knowledge? Or? Um, that's a really good question. So <laughs> the corollary of the question is if, if you're getting things from Belgium, Verona, Brazil, Canada, the carbon footprint, is not so great, right? So I think in some cases like this, there's a compromise that the, um, the availability of materials, this kind of steel, for example, isn't made in the United States. ArcelorMittal is the folks, or one of the, you know, it's basically, it's made in Scandinavia or Belgium, um, so it had to come from there. Um, the fabricator is someone that we know and selected to do the fabrication because we knew that he cared and he was precise, etc. So that was the key decision. They, there, were, there were, you know, two or three fabricators that we said, we really only can work with one of these guys, and um, then eventually ended up with one of them. He said the best place to make the pipes was at this company in Verona. 
So some of that comes from there. The castings were made with a company in Canada that I knew who specialized in organizing castings. And they said the best people are in Brazil. So it's, 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 it's a series of relationships that you plug into. But it's like the same thing between architects and engineers is that, that hopefully you find relationships with fabricators who are skilled and, and whom you trust. I, right now I'm working with a great fabricator who makes um, stone, milled stone. Um, and we're building this structure that is just a series of stacks of large pieces of white marble. Um, they are very precise so that we can make these pieces of stone that are all curved in all directions with a two millimeter um, tolerance so the joints are tiny. It's almost kind of Peruvian, you know, Machu Picchu-like. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's not many people can do that. Um, which goes back to the question of, you know, the kind of work, if you're going to do this, you have to be doing it within, a, within an environment of people who also want to be doing this and doing it well with a client who's willing to support that process. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you for your sharing. And I, I remember you, you finished the project in Nanjing Sifang Museum, also yeah. designed by Stephen Ho. I, I, yeah. I remember the cantilever was so, so, so astonishing. <laughs> it yeah. seems very scary. And I, I was, I'm wondering, um, during the design process, you work with different architects. And is it normal you have a kind of a confliction between the structural design and the architect design? Because it seems like sometimes architect might have kind of a, I mean, crazy idea, or sometimes it's not easy to manageable. Well, that was a crazy idea, no? Nanjing? That was, that was a, the Nanjing is a crazy idea. Yes, the Shifang Museum in Nanjing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so I, I wonder, is it normal to have a confliction between the architect and the structural design, and that sometimes may relate to the aesthetic aspect or structural safety concern? That's you know, it's yeah. like any relationship. I think if somebody has a crazy idea that you love, then you find a way to work together, maybe to adapt it a little bit, but to make it happen. If it's a crazy idea that's not so wonderful, then maybe you suggest they try talking to somebody else. Um, I think, you know, you choose your crazy idea. That was a funny project because we designed that project. It was part of a complex that Isozaki had organized, which had Sejima and others. And um, we designed that project. They built the steel structure, and then it stood there for over a year. And so it was like a Monet haystack, because you could take pictures of that structure in the winter covered in snow, and then you come back in the spring and take pictures of it with flowers in the field below, and so on and so forth. So it, was, it, it, it had a poetic quality simply because they didn't finish it for, I don't know, two years even or something. Um, but yeah, that was, a, that was fun. Hi, thanks for this lecture. Um, I have a very practical question about um, are you still following the maintenance procedure after, afterwards, after the finished building, except for the uh, Beijing MoMA? And what about the maintenance procedure and perhaps their cost? Yeah. Uh, that's a really good question. We. In some cases, yes. I mean, for the Kimball, for example, we continue to have a relationship with the Kimball Museum. Um, we worked with them last year. We put together a team that did an inspection of the Khan building um, because it was turning 50, and they wanted some evaluation of the condition of everything. So we go back and we talk and we, we look at the wood. I mean, wood also has... You need, to maintain, you need to maintain wood, so every so often you have to sand it and put a new um, coating on it. So it depends on the client. 
you know, whether they, um, they want that kind of relationship or not. It's not something that you can really impose. Um, you do show up and look, um, but did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, thank you for your beautiful lecture. Um, while listening you speak about your background and also showing Maris Cunningham and John Cage, uh, I, can, I couldn't help but think about the Black Mountain College and the, the special, special focus they had on combining or complementing education uh, with art and science. And yeah, I'm curious to know what are your thoughts on, or if you have any comments on the current uh, educational system, right? specifically in architecture school or in engineering school. Educational system now? Well, yeah, or in general, actually. It's, well, I think, I mean, in the, maybe, maybe it's, 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 it's applicable in, in this institution People do tend to think that there is something intrinsically different about someone who goes down the path of becoming an architect or an artist and uh, someone who goes down the path of being an engineer or a scientist. That they, they think different, their sensibilities are different. And that it's sometimes difficult when you bring architects and engineers together for them to find a common language. My experience is that that, that, that common language exists at the outset but that the way that we're trained in our institutions is, um, is to, to push, push those apart. That, that, that the creativity that's in, inherent in science and engineering is not highlighted as much. That we don't teach the history of science and engineering. You know, you go to school, you become a, a civil engineer, a structural engineer. You don't really take any classes in the history of engineering. So you don't, you, you're not exposed to the fact that there are these continuities of practice. You know, you think about Switzerland, you know, Maya, Christian Men, Jörg Konzett, all different generations, all influenced by each other. And so when you look at the work of Konzett, you have to think about the ways in which Konzett is reinterpreting what he saw in Christian Men and Maya and, and and creating his own version of these, uh, of this body of work, much like a poet does, looking back at the history of poetry, um, or an architect does, and thinks and talks about when they explain their work. You know, I'm I'm in, I'm inspired by so and so, and you know, I'm of the. I feel like I belong to a lineage that ties to Chipperfield and other like, like, like um, architects, or I'm of a lineage that ties to Peter Eisenman. You don't see that so much as a conversation in, in engineering schools. And so we're, 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 we're educated in different ways that make it more difficult uh, for us to talk to each other. So a lot of the things that I've tried to do at MoMA over the years has been to try to bring that up, but it's difficult. Um, you know, th this project, for example, you know, it required a lot of interpretation, it required a lot of decisions, all of which I think were very much in the spirit of what David Hammonds had in mind. But because of the way he operates, there wasn't a lot of exchange there. And so I had to make these decisions. But the role that I played is not really part of the the story that people tell. Because somehow, from the drawing to this, something miraculous happened. Somebody, you know, fabricated and voila. So that, that transition from concept to, ex to, to result is, is invisible in much of the critical dialogue that you get around, around architectural projects. Um, you know, I, I, have a, I have a long argument with, with crit friends who are critics, particularly in the 
um, architectural press that they don't know how to look at architecture the way that a film critic can look at a film. You talk to a film critic and they will tell you how the cinematography in The Godfather by Gordon Willis is, is done in a very particular way, the chiaroscuro that you get in there, the darkness of it, all of that is a distinct look that is consistent throughout the Godfather movies that Willis developed and contributed to that. They see that. They see the ways in which the repertory of all the different actors interplay. You know, I can go on. It's impossible for them to write about those movies without reflecting on those contributions. There's not a single architectural critic that I'm aware of who can walk up to a building, even Louis Kahn's building of the Kimball, and talk intelligently about how that is the result of this complicated relationship that Kahn had with August Commandant, or Piano and Rice, et cetera. Um, we don't have the critical language, or not enough critical language that addresses those sorts of relationships, let alone talks within the body of engineering works about these continuities that exist. You know, um, I'm very aware of certain things that are similar to stuff that I've done which I'm reacting to, but you know, I, I, I don't think anybody else sees it. Um, so I think the education is pulling us apart, but it's not necessarily so. You know. Thank you. Hi, um, um, I want to ask a follow-up question with the answer that you just gave. Uh, because you were t saying that maybe in the education we're being pulled apart. And I wonder if in your presentation or when people are looking at your, your work, is there any like common ground or common reaction that's despite backgrounds? Yes, oh sure. I think, I mean, I, I have architect friends with whom, and engineer friends with whom we have these conversations. Jorg up there and I have these conversations about Fray Otto and, and um, no, there are, definitely, there are definitely conversations that happen that see the complexity of these kinds of projects or other people's projects where all these factors and influences come together. Um, I mean, it's really interesting, for example, think about Fray Otto, talking about Fray Otto, thinking about Fray Otto, thinking about the influence that he had on different projects, you know, if you, if you study the Munich Stadium. Um, you know, Banish took an idea from Otto without involving him in the competition, won a competition with Otto's vocabulary, was then told by the government, you better bring this guy in because he knows stuff that you're going to need. Obviously, you, you know, borrowed from his ideas. Um, and then they had no idea between the two of them how to get it done. And so they then brought in a whole bunch of other people. So then if you sort of dig into the history of the Munich Stadium, it's this wonderful convergence. It is a vortex of all these coincidences and contributors, York Schleich, emerging in that project. Um, Eastler coming in and then going out. Um, Fritz Leonard playing a role as a kind of godfather and so on. The landscape design, you know, everything. Um, so I think a lot of people see that and reflect on it and write about it. Um, so there's, there's enough of this kind of study and criticism that, that is happening. So maybe is that vortex the shared desire of maybe... Uh, seeing something that could be realized through different roles, but the sharing moment or the common ground exactly. is that. Exactly. That's exactly the idea. And I think that it's hard to, it's often circumstantial. You, you, you get lucky, you know, if you happen to be in the right place at the right time and you get commissioned to do the Menil Museum and you're a young Renzo Piano coming out of the Bobul Center and you have a terrific client and an incredible group of art directors, that's a vortex, you know. And, and you have a moment then in your career <laughs> that you probably look back on for the rest of your life, you know, 
that was it, you know, and you, 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 you hope that that happens again. Um, and then if you write about it and you think about it, then you, you, can, you can identify what makes that magic happen. What do you think made that magic happen for you? Sorry, <laughs> I can't stop. Sorry? What do you think is that magic for you? Did you? It's, it's, it's relationships, you know. It's just building, like I said, building the trust with other people that you can, given the right circumstances, really step up and, 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 and meet the occasion. Uh, I mean, this, this is probably going to be, you know, one of the two or three great projects in my career because of the convergence of different um, people and, and opportunities that it, it represented. And in the end, it feels like a miracle. You know, the fact that these lines are straight <laughs> is, you know, could have been otherwise. Thank you. Thanks for all these questions. They're really great. Well, and thank you for the very inspiring lecture. Thank so, you. With jet lag, mind you. So thank you.